Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4230, Abstract Algebra 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misselnine. Now, in lecture 34, we introduced the fundamental theorem of Galois theory and established this very important Galois correspondence between subfields of a field and the subgroups of the Galois group. And we did some examples, and we computed two Galois groups of order 4. In lecture 35, I want to do some more computations of Galois groups. These ones will be a little bit more involved, um, so do stick with me through these ones. And so we want to establish what the Galois groups are for these for these polynomials, um, and then just demonstrate what the correspondence between the fields and the subgroups is going to look like. So in this video, we're going to tackle the polynomial x f of x equals x cubed plus 5x plus 5. Um, and so when we look at this polynomial, um, is it an irreducible polynomial? Uh, the answer is, in fact, yes. This is an irreducible polynomial. How do I know that? Well, one option of showing it, since it's a degree 3 polynomial, um, I could just check all of the possible rational roots. We're viewing this as a polynomial over the rational numbers. Uh, so this belongs to Q adjoined X. Um, and so we could choose all the, we could look at all the possible rational roots. Uh, by the rational roots, theorem, this would be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 5, and so it wouldn't be too exhausting to check all of those, especially if you use synthetic division. Um, but a much cleaner argument actually would just be Eisenstein's criterion. Uh, notice that all of the coefficients besides the leading coefficients are divisible by the prime number 5, uh, but 5 squared does not divide the constant term, so this is in fact irreducible using Eisenstein's criteria and the prime 5. So we do get this as irreducible. Um, and so not knowing exactly what it is yet, we're going to let E be the splitting field. Uh, we're going to let E be the splitting field of our polynomial F right here. Okay. And so because of that, since F is an irreducible polynomial, the three roots of F are all conjugates of each other inside of the algebraic closure. And so every field automorphism is going to permute conjugates to conjugates. And so there is this action going on here. So we can we can take, say, G to equal the Galois group, the Galois group of E over F. So it's the Galois group of the polynomial. We can naturally view this as a subgroup of S3, which, of course, S3 has order 6. Um, and now the first thing we can do is let's take a single root of the polynomial, okay? Let's say that alpha is a root of the polynomial. Um, so alpha belongs to E such that F of alpha, which is going to equal alpha cubed plus 5 alpha plus 5 is equal to 0, okay? So in particular, this relationship does tell us that alpha cubed is equal to negative 5 times alpha plus 1. Uh, this is the relationship we can infer from this polynomial here. So that's what we know about alpha. Now, if we wanted to use something like the cubic formula, we could come up with an exact expression of what alpha would look like, plus its two other conjugates, using square roots and cube roots and things things like that. That gets very, very complicated, but one could do that. Um, I'm trying to compute what the Galois group is from a more theoretical point of view, uh, that I don't necessarily need to know what alpha is to know what the Galois group of this polynomial is going to be. So um, with our field E, there is one very important subfield we now can establish. Um, so there's going to be this subfield, um, the subfield Q adjoint alpha, all right? If you look at this subfield Q adjoint alpha, uh, over Q, this is going to be a degree 3 extension, okay? How do we know that? It's degree 3 extension because it's a root of a irreducible degree 3 polynomial, all right? So noticing now that because of this, because we know this, we can also do one better. Uh, notice that E over Q, these degrees, can factor as uh, E over Q adjoint alpha times Q adjoint alpha over Q, for which, because we know the second one, we're going to get three times E and Q adjoint alpha like so. 
Um, and that's so we so we know this degree is divisible by three, but because this is because e is a splitting field over over the rational numbers, this is going to be a Galois extension um, over the rational numbers. Normal extensions and Galois extensions are one and the same thing because characteristic zero fields are separable. This is the order of our Galois group G. So this tells us that three divides the order of the Galois group, and we're contained inside of S3. So how many subgroups of S3 are divisible by three? So this is this is now where the situation we're in right now. We get that G um, is going to equal either all of S3, or it's going to equal the alternating group A3, which of course is just in this case just the cyclic group of order three. Um, and so with this with this in mind here, we now can stay a state a very general principle. If you have an irreducible cubic polynomial over the rational numbers, then your Galois group is either the cyclic group of order three or the symmetric group S3. Those are your two options. And it then comes down to deciding which of those two options are you in, right? Um, are there three automorphisms or are there six? Uh, it depends. Does this thing, does this element here, uh, alpha, does it generate the other conjugates? or does it not, right? If you have all of, if alpha can generate all the other conjugates, then in fact you get that your Galois group is gonna be Z3 in that situation. Um, if not, if there are, if there's a conjugate that doesn't belong here, that means we have to extend the field one more time. Cause the question comes down to, is this extension one or two? If it's, if this extension has degree one, then our Galois group is gonna be Z3. If our, if it's two, then our Galois group is gonna be S3. And again, that just comes down to, can the other conjugates be generated by uh, this element or not? And it, de it depends on the polynomial, right? Um, and another strategy that some people try to do here is we can develop this idea of the discriminant, right? With the quadratic, with the quadratic polynomial, as you know, you have x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, right? This discriminant tells you a lot about the nature of the solution because uh, this discriminant b squared minus 4ac uh, can tell, you know, that, that if that's a perfect square, then you'll have rational solutions. Um, I guess if it's zero, you'll just have one. It still would be rational solutions in that situation, though. Um, if it's negative, you're going to have some imaginary solutions. If it's if it's positive but not a perfect square, you'll get irrational solutions that are real. So the discriminant tells you about the nature of the solutions, which in the context of Galois theory, it tells you about field extensions. Does the root of your polynomial leave the rationals, and if it does, does it go to the reals? Does it go to the complex? Um, this tells you about the degree of the extension, right? Um, if the discriminant is a perfect square, you are going to get that the quadratic extension is only degree one. But if the discriminant is not a perfect square inside the rational field, of course, then your quadratic extension will be degree two, right? So just like quadratic polynomials, this notion of a discriminant can help us out here a lot uh, because the discriminant does make sense in this context, if we generalize the theory, uh, for which then if that discriminant turns out to be a perfect square, we're going to get that the Galois group is Z3. And if it's not a square, then we're going to see the Galois group is S3. And so that's how you can handle it in a purely algebraic manner. But again, I don't want to, I want, I don't want to develop the theory of generalized discriminants in this lecture series right now. So I'm going to utilize a little bit of topology um, to help us out here. So thinking of this polynomial as a real polynomial, um, notice that as we take the limit as x approaches infinity, you're going to get that f of x approaches infinity, right? Um, and then if you take the limit as x approaches negative infinity, we're going to see that f of x approaches negative infinity in that situation. So if we think of it as a graph, right? Our function because the leading term is a cubic here, um, it's going to point up on the right-hand side, point down on the left-hand side. So by the intermediate value theorem, if we think of this as a real value polynomial, it's going to give us that there's some point of intersection somewhere with the x-axis. So there is some x-intercept. That would be a root of the polynomial. So this polynomial, because it's a cubic polynomial, does have a real, has, a, has one real root at least. Okay? Um, there could be more real roots. There could, um, but there's at least one. So in fact, we know that there's going to be either one real root or 
uh, no, uh, there's one real root or two real roots. So thinking of our polynomial here for a moment, uh, so let me just sketch it down again. So our polynomial was x cubed plus 5x uh, plus 5. How was it 5x squared? I already forgot. Uh, nope, x cubed plus 5x plus 5. Okay, there we go. Uh, so we know it has at least one real root. If we take its derivative, right, this becomes 3x squared plus 5. Um, in the real number system, um, x squared is always non-negative. If you times that by 3, it's still non-negative. If you add 5 to it, this thing is always positive, okay? Uh, and so in particular, f prime here is going to be always positive. And since it's always positive, that translates to saying that the function f is going to be always increasing. Uh, these, of course, are consequences of the mean value theorem. And so because the function is always increasing, this tells us that it has one and only one real root. Now, for different cubic polynomials, you could have three real roots. That's a possibility, but you have one real root, okay? Um, and so these, again, these are consequences of the intermediate value theorem, which gave us the first real root. Uh, the mean value theorem is basically telling us there's not a second real root, so we have just the one real root. But there are three roots to the polynomial. Um, by the fundamental theorem of algebra, this polynomial, if we view it as a complex polynomial, it has three roots. Um, and as a consequence of the fundamental theorem of algebra, the complex roots are going to come in conjugate pairs. So let's say that alpha here was the single real root. All right. It's the only real root of this polynomial. And so then we're going to take these two other these two other roots, right? So we have two complex roots. I should say two non-real roots. Every real number is a complex number, of course. There's two non-real roots. Um, we will call one of them beta. And then the other one, I'm just going to call it beta conjugate, okay? Because uh, they're going to come in conjugate pairs like so. And so then the splitting field, uh, the splitting field E then is going to be formed by taking Q adjoint alpha uh, and beta and beta bar like so, okay? Now, be aware that whenever you adjoin two roots of a polynomial, you automatically, excuse me, if you include all roots except for one, you automatically get the last one in there as well. So this field, we actually can identify with Q adjoint alpha and Q adjoint beta like so. And so I want us to think about the possible automorphisms. One automorphism you have is that, this is an automorphism from E to E, is that you can conjugate these things, right? So you're going to have that sigma uh, sends alpha to beta. And there has to be a three cycle from what we discussed before. So if alpha goes to beta, then that tells us that beta would have to go to beta bar, and then that would have to go back to alpha when we're done. So I actually can write these things as permutations. So we can write this as the permutation alpha, beta, beta, gamma. So that's got to be an element of our Galois group G. You also would have its inverse, sigma inverse, which is going to be alpha, beta, bar, beta. That belongs to G. Um, I also can then take, we're going to take tau here to be a map from E to E, for which this map is going to be complex conjugation. All right, so this is the map that's going to send beta to beta bar, and then alpha actually is left fixed because alpha is a real number in that situation. Um, so we, we're going to end up with this. Notice that tau is a map of order two. Uh, excuse me, it's order two. Sigma is a map of order three. And so clearly, because our subgroup has our group has elements of order three and two by Lagrange's theorem, it's got to have order six. So this, in fact, tells us that the Galois group in this situation is, in fact, going to be all of S3. Since we know the Galois group is now S3, let's think of the Hase diagram associated to S3. So as a group, we have S3. Uh, there is the alternating group that lives inside of it. Uh, so just the three cycles in identity. Uh, we're going to have our transpositions. Uh, so, you know, you have the subgroup generated by 1, 2, y, 1, 3, and 2, 3, like so. And these all sit atop of the identity, like so. And so if we label the degrees of these extensions, this is 3, 2, 2, 2, and this one is 2, 3, 3, 3. So as we start gathering uh, the 
subfields of our of our field here, then it's got to be true that the lattice for the subfields is going to look like S3 right here, although it's going to be flipped upside down. Okay, so that is the top, the top group coincides with the bottom field and vice versa. So our diagram is going to look something like this, where E is going to be on the top. Um, Q is going to, I'm going to, I'm going to move it down just a teeny bit. Like so, some space worlds. So we're going to have E over here as our top field, and then Q is going to be at the bottom. Um, and then we're going to flip all of these things. There's going to be fields that go like this and down like this, for which we can then describe their degrees. These will be each degree three extensions. These will be degree two extensions. And then we also have this other field over here for which its extensions will be two and three. So those degrees are all flipped upside down there. So we want to figure out who these other fields are. So we have to look for a field. Uh, some of the subfields of E are going to be degree three extensions of Q that we can see right here. Now we already have a candidate for one of them. One of them is going to be Q adjoint alpha. Okay. Um, so Q adjoint alpha is a degree three extension of Q. And so that's got to be one of these three. And that also gives us natural candidates of who the other two are going to be. Because we could take Q adjoint beta or we could take Q adjoint beta conjugate. Um, because those are all each roots of the same minimal polynomial. And thus attaching any one of them to Q will give a degree three extension of Q. Now, if you had a field that contains two of these, like you've got alpha and beta, you'll automatically get the third one. So if you have two roots of this polynomial, you necessarily have to have the third three roots. And the reason for that is because if you have two of the roots, then the minimal polynomial has to factor as X minus alpha, X minus beta, and then the last factor has to be linear. So it would have to be X minus beta bar. So you have all three roots there. So um, you can't stick any of the roots together. So any Q adjoint alpha beta, that's going to be E, right? This is going to be Q adjoint alpha beta like so. Um, so we have to have these are all distinct conjugate fields that are going to be isomorphic to each other. Excellent, excellent. So what is then the field that's going to coincide with this, uh, with this subgroup A3 over here? It has to be a quadratic extension has to be a quadratic extension of the of the rational numbers here, but it's going to be a degree three extension up here. Okay, so really, we, well, I mean, we we know essentially what this is. This is going to be um, the whole field fixed by a three. All right. Well, what is a three going to be there? Um, how are you going to? Yeah. What is, what is a three in that situation? A three, of course, as a subgroup, um, it's going to be one, one, two, three and then one, three, two. But when we write these one, two, threes, we really should think of it as, oh, okay, I'm gonna take my roots, alpha, beta, beta, uh, beta bar there, and then you have alpha, beta bar, beta. That's really what the transpositions are, uh, the permutations, excuse me, in this situation are. And so honestly, these other fields, I can improve upon them. So how we should be thinking of is the following way, right? If alpha is fixed, it's going to be fixed by the map that sends beta to beta bar. This was actually the complex conjugation uh, that we had from before. What's going to fix beta? This is going to be a map that sends alpha to alpha bar. And then what's going to fix alpha bar? This is going to be a map that sends um, alpha to beta. And so as permutations, that's what this thing is going to look like. That's going to, um, everything will be induced from them. So we have to look for things that are going to be fixed by alpha, beta, beta bar. Okay. So can we say better than just it's the fixed field associated to A3? Absolutely we can. I um, mean, this is where that theory of discriminants really comes into play here. So while I'm not going to develop the full theory, I'm going to say the following. If you have a cubic polynomial of the form, x cubed plus ax plus b, then its discriminant will have the form negative 4a cubed minus 27b squared. And in particular, if this number is a perfect square, then it shows that the Galois group will be contained inside of a3. If this number is not a perfect square inside of the rationals, then your Galois group will not be contained inside of a3, so it's going to be a subgroup of 
of S3 that's not contained inside of A3. We already know, uh, we've already established that the group here is gonna be S3. And so this right here, this quadratic extension, because after all, this is gonna be a quadratic extension. This is going to be the field Q adjoin the square root of our discriminant. So we just have to compute what that is. Now in this example, our A and B value are both five. So we end up with negative four times five cubed minus 27 uh, times five squared. Uh, factoring this, this becomes 25 times negative 47. Um, in which case 25 is a perfect square. So really we're adjoining the square root of negative 47. Uh, that's what this other field is gonna be. That seems kind of mysterious as, as sort of like waved by magic wand, Dis discriminants. Uh, but one can further develop this concept of discriminants for uh, Galois groups and help you fill in those pieces. But even if, even if we struggle to find a good primitive element to represent this field, I did know it is all of those elements of the field that are fixed by this permutation. Um, and for which case I can investigate that. I could find it without even the discriminants, but for the sake of time, I just wanted to mention this discriminant approach to finish our puzzle.